Congregation, we can turn our Bibles again to John 17. And I'd like to read those two verses which I read earlier, John 17, verse 3, and then John 17, verse 24. This is page 958 in your pew Bible. And the thing that unites these two verses is the theme of eternal life. Eternal life. Notice first with me verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And then verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. Well, congregation, Pilgrim's Progress begins with a dramatic scene describing the main character of the story, the man named Christian. And when you first meet him, he's a dreadful sight. Uh, Bunyan describes him as being clothed in rags. He's got a Bible in his hand, a great burden on his back, and a cry on his lips, What shall I do to be saved? Thoughts of his own sin, the coming judgment, and eternal hell have all assaulted his heart so that he cries out in desperation. And then a man named Evangelist hears that cry and comes to him and tells him, flee from the wrath to come and points him in the direction of the wicked gate, the light that shines over that gate. And so Bunyan describes Christian running as fast as he can over the fields towards that light. And as we see him running, his, his wife and his children cry out after him to return. Come back home. Where are you going? You're insane. You've lost your mind. And you know, what does Bunyan say Christian does? He puts his fingers in his ears and runs crying out, Life! Life! Eternal life! And that's then what is driving him forward, moving him on this, this journey that finally ends with him arriving at the celestial city. Well, in this scene, we don't find Christian reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the life everlasting. But if you look at his life, you clearly see that he does. He obviously believes in this foundational truth because his life is different. And this congregation is something I hope you've been grasping as we've worked through the Apostles' Creed together. That yes, it's important to know and recite the truths of the Creed, but to believe these things, to really and truly believe these things with your hearts, mean they will make a difference in your life. Can others see that you believe in the life everlasting? Is there a new direction to your life? Just like Christian here, fleeing the city of destruction, yelling, life, life, eternal life, are you headed with him to the celestial city, to heaven? Or are these just empty words that we recite that have no action or activity behind them? Well, if you haven't begun on the narrow way that leads to heaven, then I pray that this final, climactic article of the creed would be used by the Spirit to help you start that journey. I believe in the life everlasting. Our theme, our title is Life, Life, Eternal Life. We have two points. First, already alive. And second, forever alive. Life, life, eternal life, already alive, and forever alive. Children, what is the life everlasting? How would you answer that question? I, as you think about it, I imagine your first answer is probably that it's what the Christian, the, the, the true Christian, the believer experiences when they die or when Jesus comes back. Uh, it's 
everlasting life. It's the never-ending life in heaven. Now, in a sense, you're right. That's part of the answer. But biblically speaking, that's not even the main part of what we're confessing when we speak about eternal life. And so the point that we must see first is that true Christians already enjoy eternal life. Uh, This is something that we already possess. Those who have this spirit-worked saving faith in Jesus, they are already alive. They have this eternal life here and now. It's not something off just in the future, but it's already uh, something they possess. And notice how our catechism put that. It says, part of the comfort of believing in the life everlasting is that I now feel in my heart the beginning of eternal joy. And this is something that we find beautifully in our text. Uh, John 17 is, as we said, Christ's high priestly prayer. And he most likely spoke this in the upper room just after uh, the Passover and after his upper room discourses. And it's the night of his trial. Right before going to the Garden of Gethsemane, Christ offers up this prayer. And so it's one of the most significant moments in Christ's earthly life. Here we find the captain of our salvation right before he goes into the final battle. And it's at this moment that he pours out his heart to his Father in heaven. And he also exposes his heart to his disciples on earth, allowing us to listen in on his prayer. Now notice in the first five verses of Christ's prayer, he's mainly praying for himself and for his saving mission. And notice the emphasis he places on that word glorify. Uh, Verse 1, Father, glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. Verse 4, I have glorified you on the earth. Verse 5, now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And, And so here we find Christ praying his favorite request. Praying that the glory of the triune God would be seen and known, that the Father and the Son would be honored. This magnifying of the persons of the Trinity is at the heart of all that God does. Uh, Every action of God serves this purpose, and that's true of Christ then in this final hours of his life. He's here to glorify God. That's the aim And yet notice, in the midst of this pleading for God's glory, Christ brings up eternal life. Verse 2, that he, speaking of himself, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And so Christ has come, he's saying, in order to give this great gift of eternal life. This is why he has taken on human nature. Uh, This is why he has suffered. This is why he was despised and rejected. This is why he's standing here in our text at this Uh, final moment at the door of death, all of this is to give the gift of eternal life. So notice how important this theme is, this this gift, this thing that we're we're discovering this morning is to Christ. And and to stress the importance of that, see the connection that is here. Uh, God's glory, the thing that God is most concerned about, is intricately bound up in Christ being successful in purchasing and then giving this eternal life to his chosen people. If Christ fails, his chosen people don't live, and God does not receive the glory that he's due. Eternal life. Now, in John's gospel, Jesus has already made a point Uh, has already made this point that he's come to give eternal life. You think of maybe John 3. And there in John 3, verse 14, Jesus says, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so there in the beginning of the gospel already, the death of Christ on the cross is seen as necessary in order for him to give this life. 
And then again, in, in John 5, really a key text, I, I would commend you to turn there, John 5, verse 24, a key passage when thinking about what is eternal life. John 5, verse 24, Jesus highlights the importance when he says, most assuredly, or truly, truly, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. And then notice that there are two blessings of this everlasting life. He says, and they shall not come into judgment. That means no eternal condemnation, but has passed from death into life. And it's that second thing, that that passing from death into life that we're focusing on here. Notice it's already happened. The believer has already passed from death to life. They already have this eternal life. In verse 25, then the next verse, it explains this more. Again, most assuredly, truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. When Jesus says this, he isn't primarily talking about physical resurrection. He's talking about spiritual resurrection. He says this is happening now in his ministry. As Christ goes out and as he speaks the word of truth, he preaches with authority and spiritually dead sinners are coming to life. Think of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the man who was dead and enslaved to money. Jesus looks at him, speaks with authority, and he's given life. Or the poor blind Bartimaeus, have mercy on me, son of David. Jesus has mercy on him, and he's given life. Or self-righteous Nicodemus, who at first is so confused in John 3, but then by the end of this gospel, we find him burning the blessed body of the Savior. Or, Or the woman at the well, Who's, who's thirsting for satisfaction in this world, who's, who's had five husbands. The man she lives with now is not her husband. And here's the one who has the words of eternal life. And so this is new life. This, this life that's worked by the Spirit of Christ, applying the Word of Christ, that is eternal life. And what an amazing gift it is. What a gift it is when we can. Consp- Consider our spiritual death in Adam. By nature, we are all spiritually lifeless. We are all limp spiritually. My unbelieving friend, don't you know that that's your problem? Don't you feel this this deadness of soul? Doesn't that concern you that the things that really count, the things that really matter, they don't seem to impress you? There's an eternity ahead of you. And yet you can't stop to think about it for a minute. John 1 has described this spiritual lifelessness. lifelessness. There in John 1, Jesus, the word of God, was in the world. The world was made through him, and the world did not know him. That's the thunderbolt from heaven describing our condition by nature. The world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Here is the eternal Son of God, the one who's full of grace and truth, walking among his creation, among his creatures, and yet they don't know him. And worse than that, they did not receive him. That is, they rejected him. They don't want him. Jesus comes knocking on the door of their hearts and they say, we don't want you in our lives. That's our condition by nature. This deadness, this this hatred towards God. In John 8, Jesus has told us that the one who sins is enslaved to sin. That's who we are by nature. We are those who are bound and bent on trying to dethrone God. That's what sin is, an attack on God, an attempt to dethrone God, and we are enslaved to that by nature. If it was in our power, we would kill God. That's how depraved we are by nature. Rebels, 
dead, we would put to death the author of life. And yet it's to this hard, evil, vile heart that Jesus speaks life. Rise from the dead, sinner. And in an instant, the sinner rises. When they hear the word of Christ, the, he is the one who gives life to the valley of dry bones. He has the words of eternal life. Do you know this life for yourself? Have you been made alive? What a miracle. What a gift. If this is yours, if this is you, then you are a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. That means if you are a Christian, a true Christian, then you are living proof of the future new creation that's coming. You are the first fruits, the spirit of life who will renovate all of the new heavens and new earth. He's already renovating your soul. What a gift. You have eternal life. He's made you alive. But not only that, he's come to live in you. John 14, verse 16, Jesus says, I I will pray the Father. He will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever and he will be in you. That's yours, child of God. You have the first things of this eternal joy. You have the Spirit himself dwelling in you. John 7, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water, speaking of the Spirit. This is your state now, child of God. You have the spirit of Christ. You are alive. And you have the spirit of life living in you. Well, all of this is the background. Jesus has said all of this before he gets to John 17, 3. And here Jesus gives us his definition of eternal life. And this is eternal life that they may know you. The only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is the substance of what it means to have eternal life, to know God, the heart of eternal life, the life or the soul of eternal life is this, to know God, to have a spiritual knowledge of God. Now this word know, it's not just knowing information, knowing the creed, it's important, but this knowing, it's this intimate knowledge that involves this this personal relationship with God in Jesus Christ. D.A. Carson says, eternal life is not so much everlasting life as personal knowledge of the everlasting one. That's Christ's point. Do you know the everlasting one? This is what the spiritually alive person is able to do, to know God. This is what the spiritually alive person wants to do, to know God. Yes, it's not that the Christian is thinking this way all the time, but the Spirit is, is, is leading the, the child of God back to this. Lord, I want to know you. Didn't that cry come up in your heart this morning? Maybe it, was, maybe it wasn't a, a cry of, of, of fire as, as if this is a place where you are now, but maybe it was a cry of coldness. Lord, it's cold in here. I want to know you. That's the Spirit. The Spirit works that in the hearts of his people. It's God's children who want to have communion with God, and that's the gift that Jesus gives. And so do you know him in this experiential way? Have you tasted and seen that God is good? Or is God still bland to you? Or maybe even distasteful? If so, then run. Run to this one who has life. Run to this one who gives life asking him to awaken your spiritual taste buds, to desire after this God, to taste his goodness. And child of God, this is you already. There's encouragement here. What what hope? You already are alive. It's not something you're just waiting for. Already the Christian's life is directed towards God like the, like the compass on, on a, or the needle on a compass is, is pointing back towards north. So God is doing this in your life. When you go to sin, he leads you back in repentance. He keeps bringing you back to himself. And so these are the beginnings we already enjoy. This is what separates Christians from unbelievers. Today and in eternity, they 
know God. And so if you are already alive, then you will be forever alive. That takes us to our second point, forever alive. And our point here is that true Christians will forever enjoy the fullness of eternal life. Yes, Christians are already alive. They already uh, know God and, and are growing in their knowledge of God. But true Christians will forever enjoy the fullness of eternal life. Again, our catechism says after this life, that's when it comes, after this life when we breathe our last and pass in death or when Jesus comes back, after this life, I shall inherit perfect salvation. That is, I shall inherit complete salvation. All of the benefits that Christ has purchased for me. And so this means, child of God, that the best is yet to come. Yes, you already have so much. Uh, This world doesn't know what life is. You know what life is. You know God. But the best is yet to come. Already, yes, we have the first fruits, but we're waiting for the full harvest. Already we've tasted the appetizer, but we're waiting for the full feast. What's the fullness? What's the fullness of this eternal life? First, there's no more sorrows. No more sorrows. What a blessed thought that is, child of God. Have you thought about that recently? There's a time coming when there will be no more sorrows. No more tears. No more suffering. No more disappointments. No more aching and aging bodies. No more disease. No more torn relationships. No more sorrows. We confess that we believe in the life everlasting. How much difference is that making as we go through difficulties? Are we using this truth to encourage us, to help us to endure, to help us to press on as we go through trials? Do we bring this to mind? This is, this is ample fuel that, that God is giving to us to, to keep our, our, our spiritual cars driving when our tanks get empty. This is what Jesus did, Hebrews 12, for the joy that was set before him, for the eternal glories that were set before him. He endured the cross. If Jesus needed this, we need the same. Use the truths you believe to to encourage yourself and to help you press on and to endure. No more sorrows. But second, no more sin. No more sin. What a blessed thought that is. No more grieving the God we love. No more asserting our law over his. No more straying from our shepherd, uh, leaving his good paths. No more dealing also then with the consequences of our sin. No more separation from God. No more distance. Where it seems that because of our sin, uh, he's withdrawn himself. No more of that. No more backsliding seasons where our hearts are cold. No more empty prayers. No more distracted thoughts of God. No more hypocrisy. Child of God, don't you often feel like we live in a desert and you're going through these wilderness wanderings just like Israel? So often we seem deserted by God. So often our hearts seem dry and dusty. No more. No more of that. We'll be done with this body of sin. The fountain of our original sin will finally be exhausted. There will be no more actual sins spewing out. We'll be glorified. Uh, That final mortal enemy will be slain at last. Don't you long for this day, Christian. Is this truth making a difference in your life as as you think about your sanctification? As you think about how you you fight sin and and so are, are so easily grown discouraged and and ready to give in. It seems like we'll never win this battle. I keep falling for these same old tricks that Satan sets before me. There's a day when you will fall no more. Lift up your head, child of God. That day is coming. No more sin. The sin and the curse of sin will be gone. No more division of God's people. No more envy. No more greed. No more pride. That's what your believing loved ones are already enjoying. No more suffering, no more sin. 
And the joys that wait on the other side of death is unlike anything we've seen before. Uh, We don't know exactly, but just think about your best and happiest moment of life and times it by a million and you still aren't there yet. The Bible doesn't tell us everything, far from it, but it does give us some descriptions. This eternal life, the fullness of this eternal life, means a beautiful city uh, in a fruitful garden with the tree of life and living waters. There will be streets of gold, seas of crystal, walls of precious stones, gates of pearls. There will be a wedding feast. These are the descriptions. Oh, what joy, what endless blessings lie ahead. On that last and final day when Christ returns, we'll have these new glorified bodies. Suffering child of God, you whose body is breaking down, there's a new body. Your body will be raised with newness of life. No more deformities. No more weaknesses. Set that truth in front of you. We'll live in a a renovated new heavens and new earth. We'll be given meaningful work to do. We'll be serving our God. We'll be enjoying the pleasures of God's new creation. We'll marvel at his creativity as he has redesigned this creation. And we'll use our gifts and be perfectly fulfilled in working for him. And we'll perfectly obey our God. I will be perfectly holy, perfectly set apart for God. Our hearts will be like Christ's heart. I will be perfectly sanctified. I will be only capable of delighting in God's law. It will be perfectly written upon our hearts. And so we'll perfectly hate any thought of sin. We'll hate anything God hates and we'll love everything God loves. That's our future. I will be like the angels who, who promptly and quickly and, and cheerfully do the king's bidding Right now, the angels in heaven hear the command and they do it with delight. We'll be like that. Uh, this, is, this is our future. Child of God, isn't this what you're longing for? Don't you put this in front of you? Isn't this your hope? Uh, it's far better than any dream vacation, far better than any retirement plans. This is your certain future. Glory. And yet, congregation... While all of these things are glorious blessings of the Christian's eternity, we've not yet gotten to the heart of the matter. We've only been dealing with the peripheral blessings. And so let's now go to the pinnacle of the fullness of eternal life. The heaven of heavens is what we find Jesus praying in verse 24. Verse 24, Father, here's the best part of heaven. I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundations of the world. What astounding words fill the heart of our blessed Savior. First of all, child of God, look at how Christ describes you, his people. He describes you as those given to him. Those given to him. Do you hear that, child of God? You are the Father's love gift to the Son. Chosen before the foundation of the world to be be his prized possession, a gift from the Father to the Son, this is telling us there's an arranged marriage. Uh, The Father eternally chose the bride for Christ. And, and, And the Father presents you then, you sinner, straying one, but who's been washed in the blood and who has the spirit of Christ living in you and who has this hope of heaven, you are the gift of the Father to the Son. And the Son can't wait to be with you. That's the second thing. Father, I desire that they may be with me where I am. This is what Christ wants most for you, child of God. This is the deepest longings of his heart. Not just that you'll be done with suffering. Not just that you'll be done with sinning. Yes, Jesus wants that. He died to make both of those things possible. But that, if that's all that we had, Christ wouldn't be satisfied. He wouldn't be happy if we only had no more suffering and no more sinning, and yet we're apart from him. He wants us. 
He wants us in his presence. Uh, He wants to bring us to heaven. This is his greatest desire. This is the deepest longings of our high priest's heart, that we might be with him. He loves you, child of God. He delights in you. He loves you completely. And that's why he wants all of your life. He wants every square inch of your heart because he loves you. And so he doesn't want you sinning anymore. He doesn't want you going after other lovers. And there are times when, when he withdraws his presence from you because he wants to show you that he disapproves of those things. And those things are killing you. He isn't content letting any portion of you remain untouched by his love. He wants all of you. And he wants you to be with him. Christ prayed this and had it recorded in Scripture so we could know the heart of our high priest as he ever lives to make intercession for us. This is what is on his heart as he pleads for you, child of God. Let your heart melt as you look into the heart of Christ. And why does he want us with him? So we might behold his glory. This is the pinnacle of heaven. This is the beatific vision. This is the best part. And in John 12, verse 41, John has told us that in Isaiah's day, Isaiah saw Jesus Christ seated on the throne. And Isaiah saw Isaiah 6 where Christ was on the throne and the seraphim are covering their eyes, surrounding him, crying out, holy, holy, holy. And yet we shall see him. We shall see him. We live in a world that does not recognize the glory of Christ. We live in a world that curses Christ's name. We live in a world where the light of his glory Though it shines, it's not seen. But then we shall enter into Emmanuel's land. And he's all the glory of Emmanuel's land. There his glory is loved, and there we will see his glory, the unveiled glory of Christ. 1 Corinthians 13, 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. We will know him as he knows us in fullness. Yes, now we live by faith looking to Christ, but then we will live by sight gazing upon his beauty. This is the pinnacle of eternal life. The Puritan Richard Sibbs writes, heaven is not heaven without Christ. He's the very heaven of heaven. And so I ask you this morning, do you desire what Jesus desires. Do you want to be with him, to behold his glory? This is the best thing in life, to glorify him and to enjoy him forever. You don't know joy unless you know this Savior. Do you want to go and be with him? Child of God, this is coming. This is yours. This is coming. I believe in the life everlasting Yes, that's an article of faith. I believe. But this faith is not just wishful thinking. It's not just hoping for the best. Notice here the the great security and certainty that every true Christian will be forever alive with him. And here's the security. The fact that this isn't just your desire, but this is Jesus' desire. And Jesus wanted this so badly that he died to purchase you to make that happen. And and he wants it so badly that he makes intercession for you with this prayer upon his heart. And so this is your guarantee. It's not yourself. It's not your own works. It's not your righteousness. It's your Christ. And and the strength of his unwavering desire to have you for himself and to have you forever. I believe in the life everlasting. Do you? Do you? Do you believe? Is this confession making a difference in your life? 
Do you stop to ponder what these words mean when we recite them? I believe in the life everlasting. There is an eternity of heaven or hell set before us. I believe in the life everlasting. There is a Savior who can bring us to heaven. I believe in the life everlasting. My unbelieving friend, let me make an appeal to you through the words of an old hymn. Burden one, why will you longer bear sorrows from which he releases? Open your heart and rejoicing share life more abundant in Jesus. Life, life, eternal life. Jesus alone is the giver. Life, life, abundant life. Glory to Jesus forever. Oh, may Christ be the portion of your life here now and also forever in eternity. Amen. Congregation, let us sing of this life. Psalter 203.